So you have a little blue formula sheet. This is for your exam. Your mid-chapter exam will be next week. I'm going to say it again, your mid-chapter exam will be next week. Um, all we have to do is finish six, is to do 6-3, and then we're ready for the mid-chapter exam. Um, on the formula sheet is the special right triangle uh, ratios. There, that chart's on there, so because you've already generated it, you've already practiced it, so at this point I don't expect you to have them memorized. Um, I'm going to give it to you. And then there's a new part, which is what is coming up in 6-3. That's what the other, the circle part is. Um, tomorrow, I'm going to let you have the day off um, because of the glitch with my math lab, because Paige can't even get into my math lab yet. Um, so that means that 6162 homeworks will make them do, well, 61 was supposed to be due, was it last night? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to make 61 due tonight, and then 62 will be due by Sunday, but you have tomorrow off, so make sure you get 62 done, okay? Um, I'll mark it down on my calendar as your absence to not count against you in your attendance. That's up to you to turn in a note of some type, <clears throat> you know, if you need it because of whatever's coming up at the end of the semester, because, and I use you as an example, Luke can't even go on the movie field trip because his six block teacher last semester marked him absent wrong, like he was here the rest of the day on the attendance and they won't fix it. So, people would be trying to say, hey, that's just a discrepancy, can you fix it? And they say no. Um, so if you're one of those that doesn't want that red unexcused absence, um, you're allowed up to so many parent notes. Or if you have some type of appointment to go to tomorrow, <laughs> um, you could use that as your note. But any questions? Can we just turn in a note without calling the school? Or you just put like, please excuse blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, actually you can. I did that with my son. Um, it was a personal, I just didn't want to send him on a field trip. I had a bad vibe, like there was something weird. There was another issue going on with this kid in the room that wasn't keeping their hands to themselves. Second grade. And there was a field trip and I was like, you're not going. We'll just see. You went to Atlanta. <laughs> I took him to Lego Land. <laughs> Just so you know, it was great. I have the memory, and he has the memory, and then the rest of the class went to the Chattanooga Zoo. We had way more fun. <laughs> so, yeah, all I put on the note was, please excuse him for being absent on this day, not the other. So, all right. Um, let's finish 6-2, and then you have plenty of time to, to work on your homework in class. Um, 6-2 was recalling what you already did in geometry. We're just leveling it up to college level questions. We talked about starting with what you know. We talked about how the word problems, although they may seem really complicated and difficult, they are still just basic tricks. Looking out 
at the ground and then elevating up, which is why the arrow looks like this. And that is the angle of elevation. Let's put a theta right there. Angle of depression, slightly more challenging. Angle of elevation is very straightforward. Angle of depression um, tricks people because they, they think it's this right here, and it's not. Um, angle of depression, you have to imagine being up high on something, being up super high, and then so I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. Do what? You okay. I mean, I, you know, cake, like that. I didn't bake a cake. But you didn't make me one on my birthday, so actually, you can give her any coffee. Oh, okay. So, I'm on it. We can hear We just found out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Leave it. <laughs> Angle of depression. You need to imagine being up high already, like um, up on the top of a building, um, in an airplane, in a hot air balloon. I'm trying to think of all the examples they use. On the top of a cliff, um, a bridge up high. Anyways, um, angle or lighthouse. That's, I've seen a lighthouse before. You're up at the top of some structure, and then so you have your line of sight while you're up top of something and then angle of depression would be looking down at the ground. Um, the way to remember that the angle of depression is out here with your line of sight and then looking down is to think this is a this is a an example y'all ever heard of seasonal allergy seasonal depression seasonal allergies seasonal depression Ever heard of that? It's a perfect example today when it's um, winter and especially rainy. Um, when the time changes, there's not as much sunlight. It is a scientific fact that there are more cases of seasonal depression because there's just not sun. You can't go out and enjoy the weather. Um, so think of someone that is enjoying their their um, their fall. That's our, my favorite season. They're enjoying the fall, and then the time changes, and then the next morning, uh, good luck, by the way. The next morning, the time changes, and then now it's dark at like 5:30. So they're gonna have, they're gonna be depressed. So think of someone that's happy-go-lucky, and then time changes, and it's like, okay, depressed. Y'all see those emojis with depression people? They always have their head down. Um, I'm trying to think of a way to help you remember. It. It's like, oh, everything's great, and then the time changes, and now you're sad. It is not, you're sad, and now you're looking at your shoes. Like, that's not angle of depression. So, be careful to not mistake it for this angle right there. Okay? Um, now, let's put the two together. Imagine if I merge these two pictures. So, you got your line of sight up at the top. You've got the ground on the bottom. And then you've just got some line that is in between. Angle of elevation starts with the ground tilting up, right? And then angle of depression is line of sight tilting down. So that's right here. I don't want to draw anything yet because I want to see if you can answer me. What's the relationship between angle of elevation and angle of depression? Let's see if you remember from the Do what? Keep thinking. You're so close. What? Um, do y'all remember in geometry parallel lines cut by a transversal alternate interior angles? An angle of depression and an angle of elevation are alternate interior angles, which means they're congruent. Um, now, what you were saying with the 90. That actually is right here. This is, when you drop that straight down, that does add to 90. Um, you can go that route. So like if I gave you the angle of depression, you could subtract it from 90 and that would give you the angle in the top.
top of the triangle, or you could just say, okay, well, then the angle of elevation is the same as the depression. So, either way. Um, so, we need to make some notes on here. I'm going to draw a congruent mark, congruent mark. The angle of elevation is equal to the angle of depression. Because alternate interior angles from geometry. And that's a way to, when you have these word problems, um, if you can remember the alternate interior angle relationship, it makes it a lot easier. So if you ever have a word problem and they give you the angle of depression, label it in the picture and then you can go straight to the angle of elevation and label it the same thing. Because a lot of times the angle of depression is not in the triangle you're looking at. It's on the outside. Um, so keep that in mind. Now let's practice it. We have a word problem. We have a picture drawn for us. So we don't have to do that part. Um, <clears throat> you know what a gondola is, or a ski ski lift, or like a what's the thing in Chattanooga that goes up the side of the mountain, the incline. You know, I've lived there all my life and I've never been on that. Um, it's not fun. Oh, maybe in the fall. So in Colorado, there's a free gondola ride that provides a spectacular view of the town. Uh, the gondolas that begin in the town at an elevation of 8,000 feet travel 5,000 feet to Station St. Sophia, whose altitude is 10,000 feet. Then they continue 3,000 feet to Mountain Village, whose elevation is 9,000 feet. What's the angle of elevation from the town? Okay, so you've got to understand what all these numbers are first. They're talking about the um, distance traveled on the gondola. They're talking about the height of the town above sea level. Um, they're talking about finding the angle of elevation and the angle of depression. So if you look at this picture, thankfully we don't have to label this. Right here, um, I don't know if part of this is cut off, this town. The town right here is at an elevation of 8,000 feet above sea level. Then the gondola is going to travel a distance of 5,000 feet to reach this town. Then over here, we've got Mountain Village, which is 9,000 feet above sea level. And if you look right here, from the gondola from here to Station St. Sophia travels 3,000 feet. Station St. Sophia is 10,000 feet above sea level. Above sea level means, in case you were wondering, like New Orleans is below sea level, which is why in Hurricane Katrina, New Orleans flooded, the levees broke, uh, because it's below sea level. Um, Denver, Colorado is called the Mile High City because it's a mile above sea level. Some people who fly into Denver get nosebleeds because of the altitude. Um, so that's what these elevation numbers mean. It's just the height of the town, right? Okay, so this town is the lowest one in the picture. Then you have this town. Then you have this town up here, uh, Station St. Sophia. Now that you understand the picture, Let's look at what it asks for. It says, what's the angle of elevation from the town to Station St. Sophia? So if we look at this picture, here's the town. Here's the 
here's Station St. Sophia. So we have this triangle right there, and I'm actually going to copy that triangle over here. So we have the gondola is how long? 5,750 feet. We're looking for the angle of elevation, which is this ground. We need another number in here. Am I going to use this number in my picture? No. Because that number is not telling me the length of this base. It's not telling me the height of this side over here. It's telling me where sea level is, right? That this town is 8,725 feet above sea level. That's not even in my triangle. So you have to be a puzzle person here. You have to look at it and think, okay, there's got to be some way to get another number here. This Imagine this triangle going all the way to here, right? Drop into perpendicular. And then imagine this triangle drops perpendicular to right there, okay? Now, how high is the town above sea level? Okay, so this is 87.25 above sea level. How high is Mountain Village above it? 9,500 above, and then how high is Station St. Sophia? 10,550, right? I heard it. Subtract. Yeah, we're going to subtract, so think about it. We have the numbers that we could actually find this altitude right here, this, this side of the triangle. This is at 10,550 to here, which falls at... 8,725. If we subtract that gap between the two towns' sea level height, then we would know this right here. So subtract that and tell me what you get. These look like sharks. trying to do like little waves like there's the sea level okay uh what'd you say 1825 mm -hmm. yep so this is 1825 feet and now we have enough information we can find theta which true function would we use so from theta position yourself and, and then check what size you have you know the opposite and you know the Hypotenuse, so that's sine. And we're getting theta, which means we have to hit the second button. I went to the nearest tenth. All right, you try B. It's saying what's the angle of depression from Station St. Sophia to Mountain Village? Well, just like I warned you, angle of depression is sometimes not in the triangle that you're actually working with. Um, you do have two triangles here. This is, you can close it in and create a rectangle and the triangles are identical. I've seen people do that. Um, I also have noticed that when I when I've shown that in class, I tend to lose some people. So if you don't see the rectangle with the split triangles, then just look at the picture. It's saying beta's right here, and then know what we just talked about, that the angle of depression will equal the angle of elevation. So just come right over here, and there's beta. Are you in degrees? No, you're in radians. 
reset the yeah there you go and then just arrow up and pull that same and it should be there you go okay so we're going to look for this angle right here i'm going to draw the triangle kind of like i did with that other one this is theta that we want What number can I fill in on the triangle? So 39, 13, that's the length of the gondola. Yep, exactly. So this one is at 9,500 feet above sea level and I would subtract it from the, the 10,550. And that would give you this this height right here, which is what is it? One thousand fifty. And then now you have the um, information you need to set it up. Which trig function are you going to use? Sine. So while all we did was find the angle using basic trig, the leveled up aspect is having this complex picture and having to know that you had to do a little subtraction here to get the number that you needed on your triangle. All right, go to this one. This problem is exactly like number eight in your homework. Um, so make a note, MML number eight, which I think I may have. Did I copy that for you? Yep, I did. See, there it is right there. Okay, so I'm going to walk you through this one which I actually think is slightly more complicated than the one in number, um, the, as number eight in my, my math lab homework. They are the exact same approach though, okay? Um, the difference here is look at your triangles. Instead of having them, you know, back to back, there, one is embedded within the other. So there's a little bit of a multi-step process here in order to get what they're actually asking for. Um, so let's go through and look at it. And, okay, U.S. Cellular Field, that's the baseball stadium. So you got to imagine you're looking at the cross section of a baseball stadium. So these, this is the nose for the tickets, you know, level one, and then this is, um, let's see, that's the cookie. So we're, we're right behind home plate, looking in this direction. Um, the home of the Chicago White Sox, okay, the first row of seats, in the upper deck is farther away from home plate and the last row of seats in the original Comiskey Park, which it replaced. So you have two different ball fields here, an old one and then the new one that got built over top of it. So if you look at it, that's why there's one triangle embedded within the other. They're saying that the first row of seats in the upper deck, so like right in here, right here, um, is farther away from home plate, home plate would be right here at the batter, than the last row of seats in the original Comiskey Park. Although there's no obstructed view, in the new field, some of the fans complain about the distance from home plate to the upper deck of seats. From seat in the last row of the upper deck directly behind the batter, 
The angle of depression for home plates, 29 degrees, and the angle of depression for the 50 pounds, 24 degrees. Find the viewing distance to home plate and the viewing distance to the 50 pounds. They've already labeled it all for you, too. So you can see right here it says D1, and then right here it says D2. So we're finding the length of the hypotenuse in the red triangle, and then we're finding the length of the hypotenuse in the blue triangle. We've got a lot of information here. If you look at the red, focus on just red. It says theta 1. Do I actually know theta? What is it? So it's either 24.2 or 29.9. If you're focusing on just the red, it would be the one that goes, the arrow goes to the red. You see that right here, this arrow drops down to the red. See this? So since that's going to the red, then that's the number we need. So that number is actually right here, 29.9 degrees. Which means theta 2 would be 24.2 because it goes to the blue. So this is 24.2 degrees. All right. Now don't overthink this. You just have two triangles here and you're trying to find the hypotenuse. We've got to look at the information we have. We've got the gap between the pitcher and the batter 60 feet. We have our angles here. We're looking for the hypotenuse. Then we have this value x here to show the distance from the batter to the back of the field, like the stadium. And then we have this height here to show the height of the, the stadium itself. So when you look at this, there's a third value that we can write in this picture that's not labeled, and it would be in terms of x. Um, look at this right here. So from the pitcher all the way to the back, which means I'm looking at the bottom of the blue triangle, right? Yes? Okay, what expression can I write for the bottom of the blue triangle? I don't know the actual length of it, but what 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 expression, polynomial, can I write? It's going to be, yep, x plus the 60.5 feet, right? That's the leveled up part. It's not just a plain old number, it's, it's a polynomial, okay? So if the goal is to find the hypotenuse, we need to know either the bottom of this or we need to know this height over here, right? We need to get an expression for, for finding the trig value that we have that, with the x and the h. Which trig function? Focus your attention just on the, um, let's do blue since we just wrote 60, the x plus 60. Focus your attention from 24.2. What trig function would use h and x plus 60 tangent? So let's set it up. Tangent 24.2 degrees equals opposite h. Adjacent is x plus 60.5. Let's get h by itself. What would I do? Multiply. Yep, elbow arm. I would multiply this crap over here to the front. Although it looks very ugly, you are just going to, it's like a brick, one of those kids' toys. You're just going to multiply it to the front. So 
So that's my expression for H from the blue triangle. What do you know about H in the red triangle in terms of length? Look at the, what? Look at the picture. H in both triangles is the same height, right? So why don't I repeat this process from the red triangle, get an expression for H, and then the two have to equal each other, and then I can get the value of X. So I'm going to draw a dotted line to show, okay, break in my thought process. Like, leave that there. Let's repeat now from the 29.9 degree angle. So tan 29.9, opposite over, what is the adjacent to the 29.9? Just X, right? Does everybody agree? All right, so we're going to cross multiply that over here to the front. Now we have two expressions for H, which means they have to be equal. So we're going to set them equal and we're going to solve for X. Because once I know X, then I can find the hypotenuse of the red. Then I can add X to the 60.5 and I can find the hypotenuse of the blue. So another break in my thought process. We're going to substitute by saying, well, that one equals H, this one equals H, so they have to both equal each other. So I'm going to set it up. I've got parentheses X plus 60.5 tan 24.2 has to equal X tan 29.9. Now here's where you, you got to know how to solve this. Don't overthink this, okay? Think of the, the tan degree as like a block, okay? Think of it as one giant variable. It's stuck together. So we've got x plus 60 times this equals x times this. We need to distribute this so we don't have these parentheses. So that would just be x tan 24.2 plus 60 tan 24.2, and then the right side comes down. So if you're wondering what I did there, because it's written funny with it being in the back of it, I distributed. And that just means you're just multiplying it together. It just goes to the front of it. Now we need everything that has an X on one side and everything that has no X on the other. So that would be a cup game of me shuffling that crap to the right and this crap to the left. You see that? Now, how do you do that? It's just subtraction. Because this one's positive, so you think of it as a giant block. I'm going to subtract this crap over here. And then this one's positive. I'm going to subtract that to the left. Go with me? Okay, so as I do that, I'm just going to show you what you can get. The part in front stays the same. That comes over here and becomes negative. That mess goes to the right and becomes negative. Now you probably see where this is going. What do you notice on the left? Terms are separated by plus and minus signs, so you have two terms here. What do you notice?
GCF. What do they have in common? They have an X in the front. Imagine if that were a giant two in the front. Sometimes it's easier with numbers. If they had a two in common, you could factor a two out, right? Well, it's they have an X in common. I can factor an X to the front, right? Okay, so I'm going to take that X and I'm going to imagine dividing it to the front, which would leave me with 10, 24, minus 10, 29. This stuff over here is still here. It's a long divide. round it out to finish. The goal is x by itself. Divide it. Think of it as a giant block. It's attached by multiplication. You're just going to move it by division underneath that mess. Right? I know. So you would end up, and I'm not, there's no way I can squeeze that or no way I can move this. That's the answer. Don't look. Okay, so I'm going to divide that right up underneath that mess. So in your calculator, we're finally there. In your calculator, you're going to enter this mess. I would definitely use that fraction math print mode because there is so much here. Make sure you're in degree. Alpha y equals, um, it helps type stuff in. Make sure you can type it all in. Put your parentheses at the end of your tan values. It does matter now. And for simplicity's sake, we're going to round to nearest whole numbers. So we're going to say that the height of that ball field um, riser is 216 feet. Or not the height, I'm sorry, the x value is 216 feet. Not the height, sorry. That'd be insane. So I know that that, I can tell by the tension in the room. I know that that, uh, that's a lot, but what we actually did was not challenging. It's just that it was the, you had like tan of an ugly number. You had another tan of an ugly number. You had another tan. All it involved was setting up your two tan ratios, realizing they both had an H in them, so you could set those values equal. You had to distribute. You had to shift. You should notice the GCF, you pull it to the front, and then you get the rest of the crap to the other side. So while it's ugly, it's all very, like, foundational steps, right? Now, that was just X. That's the beauty of it. You're not done. So X is, what, 216 feet, which means now you should be able to find D1 and D2, D1 will require the 216. D2, you're going to have to add, what, 60.5 to the 216. What trig function would you use? Let's focus on red. If, I know, if I'm trying to get the hypotenuse here, I've got my angle, and I have this adjacent side, what trig function would it be? Cosine. So you can 
can see you would cross multiply the B1 to the front, and then you'd have to divide the cosine 29 underneath, right? This would multiply over here, and that would move underneath. So you're going to type 216 divide cosine 29.9. Get two hundred. Let's see, two hundred forty-nine point seven. set up for D2? What numbers am I focusing on? you got to mute out red now. Mute the red out. 24.2, the 60.5 plus the 216, and then D2. Is it still cosine? stand to learn something that's like, you know, everybody needs grass or whatever. It's really, it's really hard to teach something that you know kids are going to hate. So just, we're in this together. I personally like this problem just because nothing in here was difficult. It was just ugly numbers. Like that's, and if someone, if you show this to someone, they would look at you and be like, you can do that? Like, you understand that? You can do no. my taxes? Yeah, you do. Um, the homework is the same concept. You've got this picture here. Um, you can see where you drop that straight down. So there's your one triangle embedded within the other triangle. 251 is from here to here. So what would this be? Let's call this x right here. And this would be x plus 251, right? Um, and then, of course, the top of the memorial, we'll call it h. Now, the goal in this question, though, is not the hypotenuse. The goal is just what's the height of the memorial? which means find H. Well, to do that, you need to know what X is. So you still have to set up your two tangent functions. Then you set them equal to solve for X. Then you go back and plug it in, and then you can get H. It's actually, there's less work involved in this one because um, the one before it, you set up your tangent functions, you set them equal, you find X. Then you would just do one trig function in 
this homework because you're just finding eight. You're not finding two different hypotenuses. You're finding just the one side right there. Okay. All right, that's it. We're done with 6-2. You have all the time left in class to keep working on your 6-2 homework. I would probably jump straight to this one. Jump straight to this one in the, my math lab. Um, and then that way it's done because this is the hardest one in the homework. And I will go in and check and see if any of them need to be removed.